Okay. All right. Great. Hello again. We are talking about skin today. So one of the things that we love to see, um, I really like to work with young girls or any teenagers with acne because one of my pet peeves is when girls with acne get put on birth control pills when they're not sexually active. We posted before about the risks of birth control pill that the longer you're on it, the more the risk. So why start it earlier than you need to? So I thought we would talk today a little bit about the um, skin. And interesting, before today's live, I, um, I had some content that I had been had compiling and wanting to talk about. And Jerick and I passed slides back and forth, but then I pulled a traditional dermatologist and I pulled an integrative dermatologist. Find out their secrets. Ooh share that with you guys. So what I think I'm going to do first is just get right to the slides. Um, let's see if there's anybody. Okay. And hopefully then Jerrica will try and see if we can still hear. Oh, yep. We still see you. You can still talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, excellent. Okay. So these are our slides. Beauty is more than skin deep. And so one of the things we've noticed is we've all, we have function, we focused on um, the, the anti-aging inside, and then we've noticed that it's also helped outside. So um, let's see how come I advance my slides. All right. Okay, so when you think of skin basics, what does a normal dermatologist say? Drink plenty of water, half of your body weight in ounces, so that you guys probably know. Make sure you want to have an omega-3 fats in your diet, either in the form of nuts and seeds or clean fish sources. So you gotta be really careful about your fish because um, we don't like farm-raised fish and we wanna make sure the source is good. We also recommend detoxing two to four times a year. Um, one of the ways that you do detox is through your skin by sweating. So a lot of times if you have toxins, it's gonna to affect your skin. And the biggest thing really is sunscreen. And I'm just gonna make a little comment about sunscreen. Uh, the physical sunscreen says zinc oxide. So any other type of sunscreen or titanium dioxide. And then the other types are, I can't even pronounce it, it's so like homo salicylate or homo whatever. And it could be like sensitive skin, but unless it's zinc, that stuff that you probably don't like that's really white, that is the real sunscreen. So that's what I would recommend using because all the rest of the stuff, my daughter has um, a sensitivity to it and she ends up getting rashes on her face if she doesn't use just the original sunscreen, which is zinc or titanium dioxide. Mm -hmm. So we're going to delve a little bit deeper in the skin. So, all right. So uh, you may have heard about the gut skin connection. So there is a huge gut skin connection that we want to talk about today, which is how we look at it when it's more of a functional medicine approach. So we know that there are bacteria in the gut. And what we see here is you have the intestine and the intestine is just one cell layer thick from your mouth to your anus actually. In, this is the barrier from what's coming inside the food that you eat, protecting your body from what is coming outside. It's one cell layer. And from that, you're going to get nutrient and fluid uptake. That's going to go to the liver. You're going to get immune tolerance too. That's going to prevent you from having any intolerances. You get immune cells that, whoops, let's see, go back at work in your intestine. You also have defense in your gut, defense against infection, and that's one of the, one of the roles of a probiotic. And then also there's a lot of sing signaling to the brain. It's much more complex than just the production of serotonin. There are enterochromaffin cells that do a lot of signaling, and, and so we're finding out more and more about this. So definitely the gut has a lot to do with your skin. So one of the things that we're finding in functional medicine is that things are overlapping. So here you see your skin disorder where a traditional dermatologist may say acne, here's the treatment, rosacea, here's the treatment, eczema, here's the treatment, psoriasis, dermatitis, all of these things are a clinical diagnosis. They're looking at the way the rash looks and they're giving you a treatment for it. Most of the time the treatment is aimed at inflammation. It's not always aimed at the cause. So I know I have had eczema my whole life. My kids, I have eczema. And so using a functional approach, we are a little bit more successful for it. So you have gut disorders here that can overlap with skin disorders. 
leaky gut. We're going to be talking a lot about leaky gut in a lot of our videos coming up. And also we're having our GI class that's on February 27th. It could be parasites, it could be yeast overgrowth, intestinal overgrowth of bacteria and bacterial overgrowth. So a lot of these gut disorders are overlapping with these skin disorders. And then just as an aside, we also see gut disorders uh, being responsible for mood disorders, depression, anxiety, brain fog. Some would even go so far to say autism. So there's a lot more that you want to dig deeper with skin than just skin. So I have here uh, two examples of what we have is stool testing. So we right now use two different labs. We're using also doctor's data, but these are probably the two be the good ones here. And so this is a sample roll. This is from Genova, a lab that we use a lot. It is a functional stool test. So a traditional stool test will either be a guaiac, which is looking, is there presence of blood or not? So it'll be positive or negative. And also when you have a uh, stool for ova and parasites, the stool sample will be there and they'll look to see if they see any parasites or they might grow up for a culture for things like C. diff, which is a bacteria that we see a lot with overgrowth or antibiotic use. But they're not doing a DNA to look at for the DNA of the bacteria. There's a couple other things that a functional stool test does too. There's markers that look to see if there's inflammation in the gut. There's markers that look at if you're digesting your food. And then there's markers that look actually at the bacteria. So this is one type of bacterial stool test that we do. <clears throat> it would be kind of like when you say, I've had a colonoscopy and everything's fine. Well, a colonoscopy only looks at the structure of your intestine to see if there is a growth. And sometimes they take biopsy. So that would be like if I came into my office and you saw Claudia and Kelly sitting there at their computers. We don't know if they're really doing work, they could be on Facebook, they could be texting, until I actually see evidence that they're actually working, that they're scheduling appointments, that they're answering your guys' phone calls. I don't really know that they're really doing work, right? So the function of the gut needs to be evaluated a little bit deeper. This is actually my GI, I guess I forgot to X out my patient identification stuff there, so excuse that, you can see that I here had my Giardia, which is a parasite, but I was looking for an example. We also do GI map, which I feel is really, really good for parasites, infections, not so much of a function. What do you think, Jerick, about the two different stool tests? Do you have an opinion? I love GI map. You know, the... GI effects from Genova, you get a couple more insights as to how you're digesting the food, but you do get a couple of those markers on GI map, and GI map's just so much more comprehensive as far as um, the specific different types of bacteria and pathogens that are in your gut. So that's, the, yeah. One of the great things is both of these labs actually will bill Medicare, and so that's really nice. Mm -hmm. for Genova, I know for sure that Medicare patients don't have to pay any additional fee, and for mm -hmm. the solution, I'm I'm not sure. I'm fairly certain they do bill, bill Medicare. So that is nice. Um, both of them will also uh, partially bill your insurance now. That is not to say your insurance will cover it, especially now that it's January and it's probably the start of your deductible. Right. So basically, when we're going to look at some of these skin things, we've got to take a look at the stool to see what's going on as far as the microbiome, the balance, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about a few skin conditions. Traditionally, when we see acne around the mouth, we think hormonal, and that's what a lot of dermatologists maybe will send this to. And theoretically, a dermatologist will say, acne is because of too much androgen. Androgen are male type hormones, it could be DHEA, or it could be testosterone. And so traditionally, you see acne during puberty when testosterone goes up, and sometimes testosterone is a little bit higher than estrogen and progesterone in puberty, as the ovaries are just starting to get ready to release eggs and, and have periods, and they can still be irregular. And of course, males, when they go through puberty, we do see a lot of acne there. However, funny that women in their 40s all of a sudden say, hey, I have acne now again, like I'm a teenager. So why is that? A lot of times it can be because the ovary is not really responding to the brain because those eggs are old and they can't hear. So as a result, it's really shouting at the ovaries and then the ovaries responding by not only getting an egg ready, but also producing some testosterone. So we do see flares in testosterone. And a lot of times what a traditional dermatologist will recommend is number one, a birth control pill, or number two, something called spironolactone. So how do those work? 
So spironolactone is a, actually a diuretic. So some doctors will be concerned about your electrolytes, but actually it is potassium sparing. So we don't always worry about that. Sometimes we will check those uh, labs on you. Um, but spironolactone blocks the, the absorption of uh, testosterone in the cell. <clears throat> and a birth control pill will, if you take estrogen orally, will increase something called sex hormone binding globulin. And by increasing that, it's going to bind up testosterone. So think of me typing at my computer. If you handcuff me, I can no longer type. Just like that testosterone is handcuffed by that sex hormone binding globulin and it can't get to the receptor and get into the hair follicle and cause oil and cause the acne. But here's the thing you have to be careful. Usually when it's puberty, a lot of times it is high androgens, but I see just as often in perimenopause, it's not high androgens, but low androgens. It's an imbalance between estrogen and testosterone. And furthermore, mm -hmm. it can also be estrogen out of balance from progesterone. So again, both of those treatments, spironolactone and oral contraceptives are treating the symptom, not the cause. So this is a patient that I have a picture of who came in for the main reason of acne. And to me, when it looks like this, it doesn't, it looks more inflammatory. I don't know if you guys can see, it's all really red here. And it was around her mouth, but it was mainly on her neck. And you know, she didn't really have it anywhere else. So we did some allergy testing for food intolerances. This was dairy. So, I'm sure, do you have anything to add about that, Jerica, at all? I see a lot of acne resolved just by the elimination of dairy and gluten, too. Um, you know, one of the number one things that I always start with is an anti-inflammatory diet for that reason, just to let's start with the basics, lower the inflammation, and then we can kind of dive further if we need to. Yeah, I mean, it seems like dairy is more often the cause, but sometimes it is gluten, you're right, or some of the other inflammatory foods. Mm -hmm. So what are the most common food allergies? Gluten and, or wheat. Now, wheat, gluten is wheat, barley, and rye. Some of the people were um, asking questions about well, what's gluten, what's wheat. So wheat, barley, and rye. Some people are just allergic to wheat. Some people are allergic to gluten, which is wheat, barley, and rye. Dairy is a big one. Now, dairy is tricky because we have a lot of different proteins in dairy. We have lactose. We have casein and we have lac, uh, lactalbumin. So most often it's not that you can't digest lactose. So lactate or lactose free is not gonna help you. It's more often the casein. And casein is a protein and it's usually in cheese. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. So you have to do, and, and you have to really eliminate for at least three to four weeks and to see if there's any improvement. Just, just a couple of days here and there and not just less for skin is not gonna be better. Soy is another thing in eggs. Those are probably the most common food allergies and food intolerances, but we've had all kinds of things. What is the strangest thing you've ever seen, Jerica, as far as an allergy causing acne or skin issues? I've seen um, tomatoes. That's kind of, that's a pretty common one, I think, actually. Um, they're a part of the nightshade family, and that's, again, the whole inflammatory pathway. Um, and then uh, I saw bananas. Some people are really oh, sensitive wow. to bananas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, bananas, definitely something that sometimes can be an issue. But so sometimes we recommend, as Jerica said, doing the, the elimination diet. Sometimes, you know, that is cheap. You don't have to pay for the food allergy testing. Some people don't want to give up their food, so they'd rather do the food testing first and then find out what they're alluded to and maybe they're mo more motivated. So that is a blood test. All right. So. Just on the dairy, sorry. Um, the one thing with dairy that I wanted to comment on is butter. So butter is 99% fat, but it is, there is that 1% of protein that's in there. So some people, if they have, you know, if the dairy is flaring up their skin, some people can tolerate butter. Other people have to eliminate the butter as well because there is still that tiny amount of the proteins in there that they're reacting to. That's a really good point. So butter is casein and lactose free, but what about ghee? So ghee is completely fat. So that's, you're not going to find any of those proteins in ghee. But if it's regular butter, there is still just a tiny trace amount in there. Okay, good to know. So you guys could still have ghee. And I found some really good ghee on the shelf in the Indian Isle at Acme, places like that. So uh, there's, there's some good uh, hints for you. If you want to do an elimination diet, you don't have to give up your butter. Mm -hmm. 
I just made my brown butter tonight. So, okay, so eczema. Eczema is something that I see a lot of. I suffer from it. My kids suffer from it. Mm -hmm. um, typically, it's red and itchy like this, and we see it in the behind the knees and the creases of the arms. Um, this a lot of times is gut, 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 gut. So the traditional treatment is, oh, you have eczema, here's a steroid cream. And the steroid cream does help, helps the itching, helps manage the inflammation. But if you don't take the cause, if you don't treat the cause, you're still going to have this. So I, a lot of times it is dairy, seems like for me, also gluten. Again, those two main ones. So again, think about a river. If someone's dumping pollution and you keep taking the pollution out, but you don't go see who's dumping it in, it's gonna be a vicious cycle of you taking the pollution out and it's gonna keep getting polluted. So that's the issue with eczema. Now, um, my son would not let me put the pictures of his face on here. He was really upset. He didn't want it, that image to be out there, but he would let me put these on. Now, unfortunately, I think the PowerPoint got these messed up. So this is before. And you can see how this is all eczema really, really, really raised. And then this is, you, this was only eight months later now. This is a couple years ago. So actually, I, it's completely gone from his arms. You can't really tell here, I mean, because it's a dark thing. But it was all over. And he had these big, dark circles. His eyebrows were coming out. And it's funny because, um, you know, he did a gluten-free diet. We are doing like some gut rehab on him. He's very reluctant to do the stool test. Unfortunately, I am still trying to get him to do that. Um, but he is taking some of the anti-inflammatory. He's been cutting things out. We've had some other allergy things tested, but I can tell right away when he eats gluten. And he was not having any gut manifestations. His biggest thing was skin. And I can tell his eyes get all flaky and itchy. And the, you know, so it's pretty pronounced and pretty quick. So these are these are. Um, this was a couple of years ago. He was 15. He's now 17. So it is better. Um, it was really more pronounced with the face pictures, but he wouldn't let me put them on. So I have a couple of things about eczema, really quick, actually. Um, so going back to the whole idea of probiotics, there are two specific strains. One's called Lactobacillus ruminosus, and the other one is Lactobacillus planetarium. Those two strains have been studied for eczema. One of them, I believe it's ruminosus, the mechanism behind that is that it actually helps you to build a tolerance to dairy. So if it's dairy that's flaring up your eczema, you take that specific probiotic and that can help to improve things. Um, and second, with the cortisone cream, so it's called cortisone, but it's actually cortisol that's in the cream. Difference between the two is cortisone is the inactive form. Cortisol would be active. So you're putting cortisol on your skin, your body's absorbing it. And we'll get to this when we talk about stress, but cortisol can actually cause what's called a leaky barrier to your skin. So although it might help immediately, it might actually be contributing to it worsening long-term. So I just wanted to mention those two things. Long-term use of steroids causes skin thinning. Right. So mm -hmm. Especially when you've got a kid, like, and he would have had to put this on so much body surface area for mm -hmm. his, see how much of his body was obviously affected by this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. So this was a really super interesting patient that we had, and she was so kind to share these pictures with us. And I actually have her as a case study in one of my, my, um, courses I teach, but this is what she looked like before she came in. Oh. So hair loss is a big thing that I see, which is technically skin, and so I see a lot of it either hormonal or with gut. So you think how she has kind of like this androgenic type mm -hmm. of hair loss here, but she ha also has it kind of all over. This is she just I think go ahead went ahead and buzzed her hair, and for me like this this right here is androgen, or we see it thinning right here. Right. Yep. Also, if people are losing whole hairs and the hair itself is thinning, we think thyroid. But I've also personally experienced, I think I shared, I had to cut my hair off, just a change in estrogen, the actual texture of your hair very quickly can get brittle. And so sometimes it looks like tiny little pieces are coming off, like you've gotten a haircut, but you haven't. And those are what's falling out. So we know that like after you have a baby, a lot of people lose their hair. Mm -hmm later but we can also see it a lot with menopause and perimenopause and estrogen dominance so this 
poor lady had been to five derm different dermatologists. She was actually getting steroid injections in her scalp. Oh. In her health. So I didn't really know if we could do anything for her. So I thought, okay, let's do some blood tests in her blood. It looked like her estrogen was unbalanced from her progesterone. She had a history of PCOS. So her androgens were not high. Her mm. estrogen was and she didn't cycle normally so I thought oh well let's try to give her progesterone I mean I don't know if it's going to help and we did a saliva test and that really showed that she had a lot of problems with um, her estrogen dominance and then this is a picture of her uh, that's incredible which was I honestly I'll be honest I didn't think I didn't know that the shoes may have this effect so we we found out two things one she made estrogen out of balance from progesterone I think that was January. The first pictures were January, and this was September of October or October of the same year, which is wow. Crazy. And all we did was give her micronized progesterone, FDA approved, biogenical, commercially available progesterone, and also we found out she also doesn't metabolize her estrogen correctly. So we gave her some supplements like DIM and B vitamins to help with that. But this was an incredible case. Unfortunately, incredible. I don't know if she. Um, she, she, I know her insurance changed. I, I think she's been back. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm hoping to hear an update on her. But this was just amazing and made me be a little. Since then, I've had a couple patients who have had complete hair loss. Uh, and it has definitely helped. And it's not always too high of estrogen. Sometimes it's low estrogen, but it's definitely worth getting the hormones. Mm -hmm. I actually had a bald spot on the back of my head right before I was diagnosed with PCOS. And then I balance my hormones and I don't have that issue anymore. So, but that's incredible. What an incredible case. Yeah. Yeah. So what is rosacea then? So rosacea is sometimes called adult acne rosacea and it's a redness on cheeks, nose, chin, and forehead. And sometimes it's stinging and it's dry. One of the recommendations is a low FODMAP diet. And we'll talk about what that is. But um, some of the supplement recommendations is just to try, try eating high biotin foods such as eggs, cauliflower, and almonds. And so again, with rosacea, look at the gut. It's linked to certain bacteria in the gut. Do you have mm -hmm. anything to add for that? So I started to get rosacea during my second pregnancy with Dom. And I was so mad because I always had, I always have had really good skin. And so when I started getting the redness and the burning, I was really frustrated and I didn't figure it out until I did the GI map and I had H. pylori, which we know from studies is linked to rosacea. It throws off your stomach acid. So I've been working through that. And one of the things that's really helped is actually the thing that has helped the most is doing the prolon, the fasting. And I've noticed that my skin is, it's starting to become less red. I wouldn't even really consider it was rosacea anymore. So that was. Yeah, that's awesome. The other thing that I have seen it, um, not only just be the gut bacteria, but also balance. Oh, I lost my train of thought here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, SIBO. SIBO. I was like, oh, yeah, SIBO. So SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Mm -hmm. also has been directly some people present with rosacea so again if you have skin manifestations and you're going to a dermatologist and you don't know why here's a reason to get you know some answers okay so low FODMAP diet uh I'm trying to remember it's like fructo oligosaccharides lactose galactins and polyols or something but basically these are what you can eat these are what you can't eat so some patients don't have a problem following this um there's some benefits i guess um if you think about this here you can have like grains you can have polenta, rice oats you can have some lactose free milk and you can have some hard cheeses so for some people that's a, a something that is great you know because it's really hard to be completely dairy free so you have a few options that you can have but on here, on the ones that you can't have, uh, excessive fruit, which is, you know, apples, pears, mangoes, and then any sweeteners, okay, and a lot, of, a lot of honey, no milk, of course, and also says goats or sheep's milk either, and a lot of cheeses. 
And then also there's a lot of vegetables, which for me would be hard. Brussels sprouts, broccoli, beet, I mean, all the things that I love, fennel, okra, onion, all of these. And then you got your wheat and your rye, and then you've got like, you know, apple, persimmons, and then you have beans, a lot of legumes that you can't eat, which would be really difficult for me as well. And then your polyols, so some other types of fruit here, more um, cauliflower would not be hard for me to avoid the peppers. I think you guys know I hate peppers and sweeteners. So this in general is a diet that is suggested from a lot of gastroenterologists. And so they suggest this for IBS. And so there's a lot of times where this type of diet, when you have some kind of inflammation, if you can't get in to get a stool test, this is one option. Jerica mentioned an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, why don't you explain, I don't think we have a slide for anti-inflammatory diet. Why don't you explain what your version of anti-inflammatory diet is? Sure, sure. So my version, it's kind of a mixture of a couple different things. So it's eliminating all the foods that produce inflammation. So that's going to be your dairy, your wheat, and gluten like we had already talked about. But a lot of it is really sugar, eliminating sugar, eliminating the processed foods. Those are really the bulk of it. Um, and then as I work with people, we say we can kind of adjust and maybe eliminate peanuts because in some people, well, peanuts can be very inflammatory and maybe eggs. So again, it's going to be, it's a little bit more individualized as we go along and work with it. But the basis of it is definitely eliminating the sugar and the processed foods, the gluten and the wheat and dairy. Right. Absolutely. All right. So psoriasis. Psoriasis is another terrible skin condition. And you can see that it looks a little bit different from the eczema because it's got these silver plaques. And so it's still inflamed, it's still itchy, it's still red and dry. Most often it's on the forehead, shins, and scalp, but this is actually also considered an autoimmune disorder. So some people have some GI issues, some people actually have some joint aches. So they end up getting put on a lot of heavy autoimmune, I can't, can't even think of what they're called right now, but there's injections, and is it Humira? There's all these super, super expensive drugs, like in, in, the, in the tone of like $1,500 a month. And so this is maddening to me because we've had really good response if we just try an anti-inflammatory diet like Jerrica just mentioned, and prebiotic and probiotic foods. So Jerrica, what are your favorite prebiotic and probiotic foods? So prebiotic foods, you know, mostly I supplement with prebiotics because a lot of people don't like the prebiotic foods. So the fa my favorite one is green bananas. It has a lot of prebiotics in it. It also has resistant starches in it. Probiotic foods, I love sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha to drink. Those are all good ones. And really, I like to have people start to ferment their own foods because that's, um, that's obviously something that's going to generate the probiotics. And it's something cool to do, too, making your own pickles and all those kind of good stuff. And it gives a different um, flavor to most dishes, too. Yeah, you can get um, some good probiotics that have prebiotics in them. And you might see it says fruit. FOS or fructo oligosaccharides, or I might just say prebiotics. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times it's just fiber or something like that. So um, that's also something that can be very helpful if you don't, if you can't see a functional doctor and you're just going to, if you have psoriasis and you just want to try the anti inflammatory diet and then maybe make sure that you're, uh, you're taking a probiotic and a prebiotic. When we recommend probiotics, we generally give a very specific personalized re recommendation and that's based on their, your stool test because some of our patients have too much stool, some of them have, I'm sorry, too much bacteria, some have too little. But if you aren't able to go to a functional doctor for whatever reason, then you can take basically a 20 uh, billion colony forming unit with a lot of different strains in it, maybe at least five or six strains um, for this particular thing. But Definitely think you guys should try the anti-inflammatory diet for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you guys, have you guys ever seen this? Keratosis pilaris? Anybody want to comment if they've had this at all? On the back of your arms specifically. Back of your arms, yeah. I know there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, my daughter Julia has this, and I know I had this um, before I took a lot of supplements. And this is actually a picture of a kid. Um, and so this, a lot of times we think omega-3s, okay? So if you have a fish allergy and you're not 
Oh, Selena says your son has it. Yep. So fish oil, um, nuts and seeds or a fish oil supplement and also vitamin D and maybe vitamin A and zinc. And I don't know, Selena, do you have your son on anything else for that? Any other suggestions or Jerrica, do you have any other suggestions for anything for this? A lot with a gluten allergy. Okay. Across the board. I always see that presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so usually we try uh, omegas, and there's some really good non-fish omegas now, like what, algae oil or something like that, mm -hmm. if you have a fish allergy, because I know forever my kids, um, we thought were allergic to fish, now two of them eat fish, Josie still doesn't, so we couldn't give them a fish oil, sal uh, 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 fish oil um, supplement, so, but definitely this is something that we see a lot. All right, hives. <laughs> This is something that has affected my family as well. Josie gets hives a lot. And at first we thought, oh, so many food allergies and, and things like that. But I will tell you, this is also from other issues. Could be hormonal. I see a lot of women who the hives seem to be a certain time of the cycle and triggered by hormonal changes. I see people who have hives triggered by stress. I have people who it is a food allergy. And um, what I see is, first of all, this could be something genetic because your body has histamine, which we think of antihistamines. Histamines are what re is released and make the skin red. And so um, with people that having in their skin, there's an enzyme called HNMT, which brought Blake's down histamine. So with us doing genetic testing, uh, a lot of times we can detect that you have a slow H&MT. So that means your body doesn't break down histamine as it should. So your, your triggers are quicker. There's also an enzyme DAO, which is more of the histamine in the gut. And so sometimes that can affect things too. Now, in the gut, there are something called mast cells. And mast cells release histamine. And so CRF receptors are cortisol releasing factor or CRA8. So that comes from the brain and it also affects not only the adrenal gland to produce cortisol, but also for the mast cells to release histamine. So my daughter, a lot of times will get these hives from stress. So if you're someone who's getting hives, I had a patient I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago that came to me and asked me to check her hormones. And I was like, it's not going to be hives. You know, I didn't say that. I was thinking that at least I'm someone who's been pretty open. <laughs> and I don't shut patients down. And you know, it was her hormones. It was estrogen dominance. And I didn't understand the mechanism that we just explained now back then, but she had been to like eight different doctors and she was on all these allergy medications and antihistamines and it's just miserable until we got everything balanced. So if there is some hives that you can't seem like you trigger and you've ruled out food, a lot of times it could be a genetic issue that you don't break down your histamine or it could be a different trigger for histamine. Do you have anything to add to that? Just on the estrogen piece, on the hormonal piece, it doesn't even have to be full-blown hives. If you notice that you itch, and you're itching constantly, and then it goes away for a while, and then it comes back again, start tracking that and see where you're itching in your cycle, because a lot of times it can be too much estrogen um, that can be the root cause of that. Very true. I suffered with that too, and I didn't know what that was from, and you're just really itchy. The other mm -hmm. thing sometimes I have is when I run in cold weather, and I come in and I like take off my clothes, yeah. my stomach, I have like a histamine release too, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not not that itchy, but so those can point to things with a problem with this. Now, my resident expert, Selena's on, on right now. She's the genetic es expert. So I don't know, maybe she'll have, I know there's a little bit of a delay, but she might have something to add to that that we can see the comments later. But definitely hives is something that could be a signal that there's something else deeper going on. Yes. All right. So what about stress? Stress is a huge effect on skin. There's so many things that can be uh, a problem and a trigger. And just as Jerrica mentioned, because of the effect of the trigger of stress and how it, it acts on that. We, we had this great diagram. I couldn't get it to, to get on here. It was the keratinocyte and had cortisol and cortisone and the CRF and how it affects. So you think your pituitary gland only affects your adrenal gland to produce cortisol, but you better believe that 
And it's so interesting that some people have more of a skin manifestation. So definitely acne. People break out when they're stressed, right? That could be the reason. Cold sores, that would really be around the mouth too. I used to have those all the time with stress when I was a resident, tons. Highs we just talked about, rashes I've seen with people, slow healing of their scars, definitely can be effective cortisol. We see that with diabetics and their cortisol is high and they don't heal as well. Yep. I just mentioned the burning itchy skin. Sometimes it could be an oily skin or sometimes it can be even a dry skin, really, really dry. So there is definitely a way that stress affects your skin. So a lot of times we don't really put importance on stress management where you're like, I'll just get through it and I'm stressed. Yeah, but everybody's stressed. So there could be a lot of things that could be the issues with, with stress, but maybe it is something that you want to address before it gets too late. So here's something that I thought was really interesting. And uh, President Obama was one of our younger presidents. And I don't know, do you know how old he was when he started in 2009? I don't know. I think he was in his 40s. I want to say he was like in his old, but isn't this amazing if you think about like, so there were other presidents that I had. I had um, Clinton and Bush, but they were older when they took office. So this is a little bit more impressive because he was in his 40s. I mean, look at his face. Look yeah. how good he looks. And this is only seven years, right? Eight years. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. Look at this. Look here. Look at his hair. And so again, here he is. If he was, I think he was like 42, for some reason, 42, 43. And we're talking about 50, early 50s for him to have that much white hair. And look, I mean, just look at his dark circle of eyes and his, his mm -hmm. forehead wrinkles. So yes, I mean, stress is huge. So we minimize that, and if I can't motivate people to address stress because of their gut, because of their memory, what about your skin and your hair? Maybe that would motivate you. What do you think, Jerica? Do you have any comments about that? I think so, too. I think, you know, you can, if you're not having manifestations on your skin because of stress, a lot of times you can just keep chugging along, like you were saying, and putting it aside. But then when it really starts to pop out, that was the limiting factor for me. I had a ton of stress going on, but it, I didn't, you know, do the test until I had rosacea on my face. Wow. So yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Okay. Well, we're lucky enough to have a history teacher on watching. She says he was 44 when he came in office. So thanks, Kim. Yes. And so this was, this is, I like to use this when I'm teaching um, doctors also, because again, this is something that really hits home that. Yes, keep your stress in touch. It's just why I don't know why my daughter Julia thinks she's going to be president someday, but maybe I better tell her, you know, it's going to age her. Because why would anyone want that job? I don't know. All right. So now, when we think of after everything you guys have heard, hopefully you'll think of the more important things. Like I said, I, I said at the beginning, I know some people joined late. I queried a traditional dermatologist and I said, what are the three most important things that you think? For skin health and I said I'm doing a, I'm doing a live today so I'm trying to find what she said um, ah, where is it she said sunscreen here it is um, she said daily sunscreen for at least uh, at least 15 up to 30 she really thinks that daily retinoids so that's retin-a improves the differentiation of skin refines texture lots of other possible things topical vitamin C um, she also said collagen. And so I also asked then an integrative dermatologist, what are the things that you think, and this is a great uh, integrative dermatologist out west in Seattle, I think, and she said sun protection, so we have an agreement there, anti-inflammatory diet, and a great sense of humor. Those were her three things that she thought. So I think just what we wanted to kind of bring to light is gut health, gut health, gut health, probiotics, and a balanced microbiome. I, I showed you at the beginning my stool test that had Giardia, which I wouldn't have thought I had a parasite. I mean, I, I've had the same bowel changes that I've had through with stress for the last 20, 30 years. Balanced hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, cortisol, balanced diet, eat the rainbow and sunscreen. Do you have anything to add to that? I think you covered it all. I think that might be our last slide. So again, if you guys have any questions, you want to hop on a discovery call, there's our, um, there's our, uh, the web address. You can hop on a complimentary discovery call. 
to see if maybe one of your skin problems is something hormonal. Talk to us to see how we test hormones. And um, there's our website right there. So we're on Facebook. Obviously, you guys are on Facebook. We are on, not really on Twitter that much, but I am on Twitter, but not that much. Are you on Twitter, Jerrica? I am too, but I'm not. Same I thing. Twitter. I think it's, I'm too old for Twitter, right? So I mean, <laughs> Instagram. So I'm going to stop share right now, and then we'll see if you guys, if we can maybe see the questions. Okay. Awesome. Okay, Cheryl said, I get acne around your mouth. So yeah, so a lot of times your dermatologist will say it's because of androgens, but what are some things that you can do if you haven't tested your hormone? Zinc is one of the things I like to tell people to take, chelated zinc, 50 milligrams. The reason being is because that is something that blocks the conversion from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Testosterone is made in your adrenal gland, and it's made also in your um, in your ovary a little bit. But there's an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, which converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone in the follicle. So hair loss, acne—that's usually dihydrotestosterone. But we don't necessarily want to squash dihydrotestosterone because that's important for libido. So zinc is something that will help for that. Um, but Selena had said vitamin A for that um, keratosis pilaris. Vitamin A is a biggie. Make sure it is not beta carotene. So that's, that's actually really good advice. Okay, anyone watching? Does anyone have any questions? We are recording this. So if you are somebody who watches this later, drop us a question in the comments. We'll be monitoring this. We'll be checking this. And we will probably, now that I'm trying to get more tech savvy, upload this up to YouTube as well. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions about skin? Jerrica, what's your skin secret then, now that it's all cleared up? What would you say? Drinking lots of water, continuing to do the fast to make sure that I'm not gonna regress and watching my stress. And I do, I do do cleaner products too. So I watch, I'm mindful of, like you were talking about the sunscreen and just making sure I'm getting good quality brands. Um, and I do use sunscreen every day. Yeah, okay. I, um, a couple things, somebody told me to always put like a moisturizer on your neck as well. Um, and so I can see that, you know, my neck still and my, you know, chest still looks pretty good because I try to make sure I do that. So obviously hydration, I think, is humongous. Hydration is important. It's a lot of what you eat. Eating the rainbow, I do follow an anti-inflammatory diet, no gluten, no dairy. I do eat sugar, though, and I probably eat a little bit of soy and eggs, but mostly no gluten, no dairy. So I think a lot of it is what you eat and hydrate. I do take a probiotic. As far as what I do on my skin is I do a vitamin C serum, like an organic vitamin C serum that I've got. And then I have my moisturizer. You know, for a while I was doing some Retin-A and I'm not really doing that much anymore. I think since the Prolon too, you're right. I think my, I haven't really needed that. Um, what else? I want to make a comment about biotin because I see a lot of women take biotin for hair, skin, and nails. Right. If you take too much biotin, it can actually cause you to break out. So you need to be careful on the dosage and on how long you're taking it. Well, I see people taking like 10,000. So what, is, what do you recommend as far as for dosing? I think 10,000 would be okay. Um, I like 5,000 usually. And I honestly, I don't really put anybody on biotin anymore unless we do a micronutrient test and we see that they're deficient in it. I've switched to collagen for hair, skin, and nails because then you kind of eliminate that issue. Talk to us a little bit about collagen. Sure. So there's different types of collagen and that go into different areas, but the two main areas is that you have collagen that builds your skin and then you have collagen that's in your joints. So oftentimes the one that we use in the office, which is what I use at home by orthomolecular, it's my favorite because it has collagen. Yeah, it's awesome. It has collagen that's good for your skin and your joints. So it's kind of a win-win in terms of that, but it helps to build up the, the um, elasticity of your skin really so that you have smoother skin and less lines. And for joints, it helps with joint pain to really support the mucilage within the joint. So again, it's, it's really a win-win. You can't really lose on that one. <laughs> All right, we'll give it one more, a little bit longer. Um, so this is how we spend our days being nerds and, and thinking of content for you guys. So I hope you guys got something out of this talk. 
Also in the comments, if you're someone who's watching it, we're going to try to do more of these lives. So if there's a topic you want to hear about, um, we don't always have to have slides on it, or maybe it's something that we've done. We've been doing these lives um, here and there in our private Facebook group. So I do have some of those slides already made. So if there's something that you want to hear about after, um, if, you watch, if you're watching this after, let us know. But I don't see any other comments. So thank you for taking time out of your uh, night. And it's maybe a holiday for some people. I got to work tomorrow. Um, but I know the teachers have another day. And I have Kim, we have another day off. But thank you for joining in. And I hope you guys have a great night. Bye, guys.